right, if you will, be turning with me to the book of Nehemiah, chapter number 5 this morning. Nehemiah, chapter number 5. As you're finding your place there this morning, I do ask, uh, just singing those songs about the faithfulness of God and that, that firm foundation that we have, does anybody like to testify to the faithfulness of God this morning? Something in your life this week or this month that has happened last month? You want to brag on God? Amen. We get pictures on a regular basis of improvements that He's making, so I think there's some faithfulness there. I just love that, that, that I don't know, I, I want to say idea, theme, just the truth of who Jesus is, that he is faithful, and, and like you guys have mentioned, I mean, different areas of need in our lives, and he's always there. If we'll just trust him, if he'll let, let him be our firm foundation. <clears throat> so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about this morning uh, in the book of Nehemiah, chapter number five, and uh, we're going through, as you know, the book of Nehemiah with the, the focus of it's time to arise. And I believe it is time uh, that we as Christians take a stand, that we say, uh, this is what I believe, this is what the Bible teaches. Let me put that first. This is what the Bible teaches, and therefore I stand on this, uh, this truth of God and who he is. And so uh, this morning I want to discuss a topic uh, that, uh, as you've already mentioned, that frustrates us, that, that causes us troubles in our Christian walk and in our our Christian life, and, and that is uh, that bondage that we can be under through our finances. And so this morning I've titled the message Financial Freedom, and no, I'm not giving a 10-step a program to get out of debt or anything like that, but I do believe uh, that if you study God's Word, and we'll see as we go through this, uh, that He does give us his plans or his will for our lives when it determine when it comes to excuse me our um, finances and so <clears throat> as I'll make mention here in just a minute uh, I, I don't believe that God intends us to be under I know we don't intend to us to be under this bondage of finances and so we've already talked about the tools that the devil uses to try to to distract uh, God's people or to stop God's people from uh, advancing in the will of God. And so here in the story of Nehemiah, of course, they're rebuilding the walls. And we looked at those tools. There was eight tools uh, that we found in Nehemiah that the devil used to deter or to cause division and to stop the work. And that's exactly what we're looking at this morning is division uh, in chapter number five. We're looking at that tool that he used. And, and I want you to pay attention to what division was over, okay? As we go through this, you'll see that it was over money matters. And so there was issues with finances. There were some troubles going on uh, financially. And so there were people that were getting mad at one another. There was division and ultimately stopping the work on the wall. And so I want to speak today on, on financial freedom and what that, what that looks like from a biblical standpoint. And so, uh, I, again, I said this last week and I'll say it again, I'm, by no means a financial coach. Mandy and I are working our way through financial freedom right now. Uh, so 
So bear with me because I, I needed this message probably more than anyone else here this morning. So we'll go through this together. Uh, I found it funny, <clears throat> this little quote. Uh, it said, the most sensitive nerve in the human body is the one that runs from the heart to the pocketbook. Is that not true? Uh, sometimes that, that most sensitive nerve that we can have in our body is the one that runs from the heart to the pocketbook. And so I, I want to take those three questions that we've been using through the book of Nehemiah. And again, uh, we should use any time we're studying God's word. But uh, those three quest questions, what did it mean then? What does it mean now? And then how does it apply to me personally? And so uh, my Bible in chapter number five is broken down into two sections. Uh, you've got verse 1 through 13, and, and in those verses, what we'll see this morning uh, is it shows how not to handle our finances, okay? Uh, how that we should not handle, and, though, and so we'll call that financial bondage. And then verses 14 through 19 deal with how to handle our finances, and we'll call that financial freedom. And <clears throat> this morning, I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible. As I was studying this week, uh, there was some verbiage, some wording that I liked better out of this one uh, than my normal New King James that I use, but, but uh, so I'm reading out of this one this morning just for the sake of, of some words that we're familiar with in our today's uh, financial terminology, I guess I'll put it that way. Uh, but so uh, let's read those first 14 verses together, <clears throat> and then we'll talk about what's going on there, and then we'll take those last verses, uh, excuse me, 14 through 19, and we'll kind of break those down individually, but but just for the whole of the story, let's start in, in verse 1. It says, There was a widespread outcry from the people and their wives against their Jewish countrymen. Some were saying, We, our sons and our daughters, are numerous. Let us get grain so that we can eat and live. Others were saying, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, We have borrowed money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. We and our children are just like our countrymen and their children, yet we are subjecting our sons and daughters to slavery. There's that word bondage, that slavery. Some of our daughters are already enslaved and daughters, uh, excuse me, already enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. And then Nehemiah comes in and he says, I became extremely angry when I heard their outcry and these complaints. After seriously considering the matter, I accused the nobles and officials, saying to them, Each of you is charging his countrymen interest. So I called a large assembly against them and said, We have done our best to buy back our Jewish countrymen who were sold to foreigners, but now you sell your own countrymen, and we have to buy them back. They remained silent and could say not a word. <clears throat> then I said, what, are you do what you are doing isn't right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God and not invite the reproach of our foreign enemies? Even I, as well as my brothers and my servants, have been lending the money and grain. Please let us stop charging this interest. Return their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses to them immediately, along with the percentage of the money, grain, new wine, and fresh oil that you have been assessing them. They responded, we will return these things and require nothing more from them. We will do as you say. So I summoned the priest and made everyone take an oath to do this. I also shook the folds of my robe and said, May God likewise shake from his house and property everyone who doesn't keep this promise. May he be shaken out and have nothing. The whole assembly said, Amen, and they praised the Lord. Then the people did as they had promised. So, Heavenly Father, God, we do come before you again this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness, God, as we were singing in those songs. Uh, God, the fact that we can trust in you and and God, just let you be our firm foundation. And God, I just pray this morning now that you would take the reading of your word, that you would just bless it to our hearts, God, that you would use it and speak to us, uh, God, and just help us to see what it is you have for us this morning. It is in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Amen. So what we see there again in those first 13 verses is the problem of financial bondage. And so these people, they're experiencing financial bondage and, and what I mean by that is uh, they're they're without food right they can't pay for their food they're having to mortgage off their land they're having to uh, put their their kids up for slavery to to be able to afford to live and so they're under this bondage and you know some people try to say that the Bible's out of date that it, it's just ancient writing that that it's good 
you know, for them back then, but it's not relevant to us. But uh, did you notice as we was reading that the similarities between the problems that they were facing and, and what we're facing today in our economy? Right? We're facing the same exact things. We're, we're facing the, the same problems, those same financial uh, bondages that they were facing. And there's four things about financial bondage uh, that we see in those first five verses. And the first one is that there was strife and division. Right? There was murmuring, there was complaining back and forth between the, the different financial or the, the, the rich and the poor. And so uh, remember, though, that the devil loves to see God's people divided. And that's what he's done here, right? He's divided them over finances. And then number two, we see that there was a shortage of supply and a very high price. And we see this in the grocery stores even today, right? We see where there's not much food, and so the farmers and the merchants have to charge more price for what they do have so that they can turn a profit or, or, or at least break even. And so there was a shortage of, of supply and there was high prices. And so verse number two talks about how difficult it was to get the food they needed to feed their family. And so then number three, it was a time when people had to mortgage their property in order to afford to live. And so, look, you talk about being in a depression, right? You're talking about financial bondage when you start mortgaging off your land and your house to feed your family. And so that's what they've done. And, and then number four, we see that they were in deep debt. Right, they had gone to the finance company. They had borrowed money to pay their taxes, and just by the way, high taxes is nothing new, right? I mean, it's been here for a long time. But but so they went. And they bought. Uh, they borrowed money so that they could pay their taxes. Uh, I read a, a little funny that I was going to share with you. This guy went to his wife, and he he told her. He says, "Well, let's go to Washington D.C. for vacation this year." And she said, "Why on earth would you want to go to Washington D.C.?" You hate politics. You hate everything about government. He says, well, I just want to go be near my money. And so truth there, right? So, yes, high taxes, deep debt. And, you know, debt is a terrible, terrible thing. And there's so many people who are under financial bondage of debt. And it's because we, I put myself in this one, we spend more and can't keep up. I remember when we were kids, probably early teens, uh, my cousin and I were down at my grandparents' house, and, and I was trying to remember what the conversation was even about or how this came up, but my cousin and I joke with each other about this quite often, but I remember my papa making this statement, and it has stuck with me because there's so much truth to it, but he was, he was kind of on his rant about things, and, and he said, I'll tell you what the problem is. People are going out buying these fancy new cars and they can't even afford a Big Mac at McDonald's. How true is that, right? And so these four things that I just listed off here resulted in God's people being in financial bondage. Again, look there in verse 5. It says that some of our daughters were enslaved. It says, uh, uh, yet we are subjecting our sons and daughters to slavery. Again, that word slavery there, it, it gives that idea of bondage, of being under the bondage of something, and in this case being uh, financial bondage. And so <clears throat> let me say this again. Financial bondage is not God's plan for his people. Financial bondage is not God's plan for his people. Uh, write down, if you write in your Bible, I encourage you to write over in the margin Beside verse 5, write down Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. And go home and read that. And, and, and when you do, what you're going to find out is that God doesn't want us to be the borrower, right? We, we're to be the lender. And so God wants to bless his people above all the other nations of the world. And that's what he's talking about there in Deuteronomy. And, and it still applies to us today. And so... God wants to give his people financial freedom, but so many are in financial bondage. And I'm going to say this several times, too, throughout my message, but I've got a note here to say it now. I'm not preaching a prosperity message, okay? I'm not saying if you're a Christian, you'll have tremendous amounts of wealth or, or anything like that. But, but what I do want us to see is that there are dangers of financial bondage because that's the devil's plan 
to keep people, God's people, in bondage. He doesn't care what kind of bondage it is as long as we're in bondage. Because when we are, just as these people here in Nehemiah's time, that causes division, strife, it causes uh, worry and anxieties, it causes troubles. And so we want to be free from those financial bondages. And so uh, as I was studying this week, I came across a financial bondage test. Now, I never thought in the world I would find something of that nature, but a financial bondage test. A and there's 10 of these things that I wanted to share them with you and uh, maybe jot them down or whatever, look at them as we go through them. A and so we'll go through these. There's 10. Uh, the first one is you charge daily expenditures because of a lack of funds. And I'm not talking about paying your gas with a credit card so that you get the bonus points. Uh, I'm talking about paying for gas on a credit card because you don't have any money in your pocket. Right? Let me get on the soapbox for just a minute. My, all of my kids are here this morning, so I'm kind of soapboxing to them, but you get to hear it. <laughs> credit cards are dangerous. Janice's granddaughter's here. Credit cards are dangerous. Credit cards are dangerous. <laughs> Credit cards are dangerous. Janice said, say it again. All right, so they are. I mean, I, I urge my kids to never get one, if, if at all possible. Don't get a credit card. Mandy and I, we got an American Express card the first time we flew up here in October of 14. It was our first card together, I believe, as far as I can remember. We were in influenced. We were encouraged to get this card so that we can buy things with it and pay then, and we build up these sky miles so that we can fly back and forth to Mississippi. And so that's what we did, and, and it was great, right? We, we have made many flights on sky miles. But here's what happens. It gets really easy to go to the store and say, hey, I like that fancy pair of boots right there. I'll put that on the American Express and pay it later. But then later comes and you don't pay it. And then so you start doing that and it begins to pile up and, and the charges begin to come in. Uh, last time I looked, the interest rate on credit cards were like 29%. So the, all this starts to pile up. And, and, and look, if you're disciplined enough to make the payment as soon as you spend it, that's great. I know people who do that, who buy everything on credit card, and as soon as they get home from the store, they pay it, and they build up these bonus points or sky miles or whatever it is that credit card offers, but, but it's so dangerous. It's like walking on a slippery slope because if you miss one payment, then it just starts building, and it's like that snowball. As, as Dave Ramsey says, the snowball of getting out of debt is the same effect getting into debt, and so... If you're disciplined enough to do it, then that's great. Uh, but there, there's just so much danger in it. And so why do you think credit card companies offer these bonuses? They know that. They're not nice. They're not saying, hey, let's help this person out and give them some, some free flights. No, they know that it's a, it's a trap. It's a, it, it can cause bondage. And so number one is, is uh, charging daily expenditures because of a lack of fun. Number two uh, you put off paying a bill until next month. So basically, there's too much month at the end of the money, right? Have you ever experienced that before? I know we have. Uh, the <coughs> too much, excuse, <coughs> excuse me, you're paying bills, putting off paying bills until next month. Number three, you borrow to pay fixed expenses, such as taxes, insurance, and other loan payments. Uh, number four, you become unaware of how much you owe. Again, Mandy and I are working through our debt, and we're, we're getting really, I mean, really close to paying off all of our unsecured debt, and I praise God for that, for being able to do that. Uh, but when we started the program and, and we sat down and added up how much we owed all of our debtors, it was scary, right? So when you become unaware of how much you owe, number five, you have creditors calling you. Number six, you take from your savings account to pay current bills. Number seven, you make new loans to pay off old ones. Number eight, and this is a big one right here. Number eight, you and your spouse argue over finances. Did you know that 40% of divorces are as a result of financial troubles? Number nine, you begin to entertain the idea of being dishonest about financial dealings. 
Number 10, you find it difficult to return God's tithe to God's house. What I mean by that is you say, well, I, I just don't have enough money to pay my tithe this month. And so if you answered yes to any of those, I'm, I'm not saying that you're wrong with God. Okay, don't hear me say that. Uh, there are a lot of people who love the Lord who are caught up uh, in this kind of trap. And that's because it is a trap. It's the devil hindering God's work. And so it's bondage that, that, that we get under uh, in our finances. And so these people in Nehemiah's day, they were under this financial bondage. And because of it, they got so frustrated that they turned on one another. Let, let me tell you this, though. This is not just for poor people, right? Wealthy people can be in financial bondage as well. And, and let me say, I'm using those terms loosely, poor and, and wealthy. I'm not talking about dirt poor and filthy rich. I'm talking about, you know where that fine line is, right? You know where that line is. And so wealthy people as well can be in financial bondage. And that's exactly what we see here in verse 6 through 13. It's the wealthy who are causing the poor to be in bondage. It's because of the wealthy's bondage that the poor is in that, uh, that state of bondage as well. And so it's written in the law of Moses that no Jew could charge interest to another Jew. And, and that's what these wealthy Jews are doing. They're breaking God's law. And Nehemiah, he calls them out on it. If you notice in verse number 6, he got just plumb mad about it. Right? The Bible says he was very angry. And so he calls them out. And, and so let me give you some questions to find out whether or not you're in financial bondage as a wealthy person or as a, a, a well-off or, or doing better than most, however you want to word that. All right? So providing your needs with a little extra at the end of the month. Let's put it that way. Providing your needs with a little extra at the end of the month. Uh, number one, do you have more faith in your money and your material goods than you do God? Number two, do you have financial goals that are not in line with the will of God? Number three, do you have a burning desire for money, right, that get rich quick? I got to have it, got to have it, how can I get it? Which leads to number four, compromising your Christian ethics, doing whatever it takes to get more money. And you see, it was it was legal for these, these wealthy people in Nehemiah's day to charge this interest, right, from a, from a civil law stance. It, there was nothing wrong with it. They could do it. But from God's law, God said, do not do this. Do not charge your fellow Jews interest. And so I, I want to tell you this morning that a person who loves money more than God and a person who will do what he can just simply because it's legal is under financial bondage. Money has become their God. And so we see that, that some people are very poor and they're in financial bondage. Some people are very rich and they're in, 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 in financial bondage. And then there's those right in the middle. And they too can be in financial bondage. So the devil has them. But now what I want us to do is kind of turn our attention, turn our focus to Nehemiah. Right? Nehemiah is God's man. This is a, a leader. He's a leader of God, and, and we're about to see why. And so there's five principles uh, that I want us to see this morning about Nehemiah and financial freedom. Okay, we can put those together that Nehemiah, being the man of God, <coughs> followed these five principles and is financially free. And so, look, every one of us here this morning, has the ability, has the, the right, I'll say, to be financially free because of what the Bible says in Philippians 4, 19. It says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, notice there that it says need and not want. Okay, I'm not saying that you can have this, uh, let's see, what is it? Let's go with the Lund. Let's go with the brand new Lund fishing boat the what do you call it the 360 imaging the three 300 horsepower motor on that baby right is that a need no that's not what the bible saying god is going to provide our needs as uh <coughs> let me read that verse again where did it go god will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory by christ jesus okay so again 
I'm not preaching prosperity, but what I'm saying is that when we follow God's principles, he will provide our needs. And so let's take these next few verses here and break them up. Uh, the first principle that I want us to look at this morning is the principle of priority. The principle of priority. Look at verse 14 and 15. It says, furthermore, from the day that King Artaxerxes appointed me to be their governor in the land of Judah, this is Nehemiah talking, from the 20th year until the 32nd year, that's 12 years, I and my associates never ate from the food allotted to the governor. The governors who preceded me had heavily burdened the people, taking from them food and wine as well as a pound of silver. Their subordinates also oppressed the people because but because of the fear of God, I did not do this. Now, what does Nehemiah mean by that? What is he saying? Well, he means that they were in such a state of emergency and there was such tor turmoil that he gave up his right as governor to tax the people so that God might be glorified. And so, in other words, he was putting God first. And so are you willing to do that? Are you willing to put God first? And, of course, we all say, yeah, we, we know that we're to put God first. But do we really mean it? Because when we say that, we, we have to mean it in every area of our life, even our finances. I can tell you firsthand what happens when you go to the car dealership and buy a truck without first seeking God. You get in a mess. Uh, but thankfully, he can get you out of that mess as well. And so in everything, we're to put God first. And that's what Nehemiah does. He follows this principle of priority, right? And so if we want financial freedom, uh, we look at the words of Jesus and see uh, how to do it. He says in Matthew 6, 33, he says, First, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And what was Jesus talking about? Well, he just got through talking about uh, the, 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 the need for clothing or money or food or whatever. Let's turn to Matthew 6. Matthew 6 and chapter, yeah, Matthew 6. Let me just read it because I think it's important to see this. Okay, let's just start in verse number 31. So don't worry saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will, what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so Jesus is saying, look, don't worry about these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then he will provide. And so, again, Nehemiah, he had this, this principle of priority, and he looked at things that he could have done, but he said, I didn't do them because I want to glorify God. So the will of God meant more to him than anything else. And if money is your God, you will never know financial freedom. Right, Whether you're rich or poor, you'll be in bondage if God is not the priority. It's like that hymn we sang, My hope is built in nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the, whole, the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. And so the principle of priority, God has got to be first in our lives, in our finances, in our family, whatever it may be. Uh, not only that, but... Uh, there's the principle of industry. Look at verse 16 with me, that first part uh, of verse 16. Bear with me. This Bible has so many notes, I can't find the verses. 16, instead I devoted myself to the construction of the wall, and all my subordinates were gathered there for the work. Now, we should draw a circle around that word work. Right. Last week I said we sometimes we get worn out and we need to rest. But do you know what the Bible also tells us? That we should work. Exodus 34 verse 21 says six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. So we should work more than we rest. 
and say, well, preacher, that's Old Testament teaching. That's the law. That don't apply to us. Well, the New Testament, the law, 1 Thessalonians 3.10 says, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. So work, that principle of industry. Do you know why uh, some folks don't have financial freedom? It's because they think that word work is a dirty word, right? Let me get on the soapbox again, again, I'm sorry. Uh, that's the problem in our country today. Too many people living off of handouts who are refusing to work, right? So the generations that are hitting the workforce right now, they think, well, you know what? I should get paid just for showing up, just for gracing my employer with my presence. I should draw a check whether I do anything or not. No. Uh, that, I'm so thankful that my dad instilled in me uh, the discipline of work, right? Me and my brother both work. You've got to work, right? If you don't work, you don't eat is what the Bible says. <clears throat> and so I try to, well, I do. I fuss at my kids again for this one. Look, you got to work, right? I, I know sometimes we get that mentality. Well, that's not my job. Well, do it anyway, right? So this generation that, that's coming in now, they just, you know what? I'll just show up and get paid. Well, that's not going to work. So we've got to work. We've got to get back to this idea of working. We've got to get back to this principle of industry. Number three, the principle of integrity. Look at that last part of verse 16. Uh, 16a says, we didn't buy any land. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that Nehemiah had integrity. He was well off. There was economic distress. He could have easily come in and bought all of this land that's been mortgaged. He could have redeemed this land <coughs> and claimed it as his own uh, to the benefit of himself and the uh, the disbenefit to those who were in need. So he refused to do that, though. That's what he says. I didn't do it, right? We didn't buy that land. And so just because it was legal didn't mean it was right. He refused to take advantage of someone else, and he refused to participate in a get-rich-quick scheme. And so ask ourselves this. Am I honest in my business, in my work, whatever it is, Am I honest with God about my tithe? Am I honest in my income tax? Am I honest when it counts? Are you willing to walk circumspect, circumspectly and with integrity? So no wonder Nehemiah was such a man of God, right? He knew the principle of priority. He knew the principle of industry. He knew what it was to work. Uh, he knew what the principle of, uh, of integrity, excuse me, I said that one. He lived an honest life. And he knew the principle of generosity. Look at verse number 17. There were 150 Jews and officials as well as guests from the surrounding nations at my table. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some fowl were prepared for me. An abundance of all kinds of wine was prepared every 10 days. But I didn't demand the food allotted to the governor because the burden on the people was so heavy. Can you imagine cooking for 150 people every night for 12 years straight. I know some of you work for lodges or cook for, for the guests or for the people in your community, whatever it may be, through the lodges. I cook for five people on a regular basis. I couldn't imagine cooking for 150 every night. And look, I'm not talking about ham sandwiches and chicken noodle soup. Right? They were eating good stuff. They were eating an ox and six sheep and all these birds and and every 10 days, they had this abundance of, of wine, of celebration, a festival, right? And so he went all out feeding 150-plus people a night. Why? Why did Nehemiah do this? Why didn't he say, well, go fend for yourself. Go, go find your own loaf of bread and, and do what you can. Because he learned the truth found in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, long before it was written, right? Luke reminds his readers of the words of Jesus in Acts 20, 35. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So where did Nehemiah get this food? Well, he wasn't taking the governor's salary. I'll tell you where he got it. God was giving it to him. Right? He learned what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, fresh down, shaken up, uh, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. So Jesus is saying, look, give. 
and you'll get. Right? It's better to give than to receive. We can't outgive God. And Nehemiah found that out, right? He put God first. He wasn't afraid to work. He was uh, he walked with integrity. He was generous with what God had blessed him with. And let me say this. If you give a dollar to the guy on the corner, don't turn around and go to the next corner and hold out your hand waiting on God to give it back. Right? We give out of the generosity of our heart, not expecting back. Do you want to break free from financial bondage and experience this financial freedom that we see here in the book of Nehemiah? I, I truly believe, I do, that if we follow these four principles in our lives, we will see it happen. Now, I'm not saying this is a four-step plan, do this and you'll be rich. I'm not saying that. All right, but what I am saying is, I believe God will provide our needs as we follow his commands, right? <clears throat> and as the scripture says, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So as we follow God's principles in our lives, he will in turn bless us with the needs that we have. And look, this don't apply to just money. Right? We're, we're not to store up money on earth where moth and rust and, and the thieves can steal. Right, uh, We're to be investing in riches and glory. And so following these principles will help us develop the skill to do that as well. Learning the principle of priority, the principle of industry, the principle of integrity, principle of generosity heavenly father god i come before you this evening or this afternoon god and uh, lord i just thank you for this message again that you've uh, god i was preaching to myself the whole time this morning and i thank you that god you can let me see the message god i just pray that as i tried to deliver it this morning god that you've helped us all to see how that we can follow your word god you, you give us guideline after guideline of how to live our lives and here in the book of nehemiah god looking at the way that he lived and the things that he did god putting you first in his life god knowing how to work and what it is to work walking with integrity god being honest in all things and not trying to cheat and and, and scandal our way through things god and and just having that spirit of generosity and help those in need god i just pray that you'd help us to take those principles Apply them to our lives, God, as we go home. God, may we keep that in our hearts and in our minds, not only in our finances, God, but just in our Christian walk and all that we do. Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to break the bondage that we are under, whatever it may be, God. I pray that you would just have freedom in our lives. God, as we put you first. Thank you for all that you are and all that you do. I love you, God. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.